All right. So welcome to our regularly scheduled Wednesday webinar. Uh, today is August 19th, 2020. And our focus today is going to be using forethought specifically for teachers who are making their lesson planner their own. And it's a good time to be learning about this topic. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Joel Atkins. I'm the digital learning coordinator for Eduphoria, and I am joined today by Paige Parker, who is the senior professional learning coach. Say hi, Paige. Good afternoon. And Tara Whedon, who is one of our newbies. She just joined the company not too long ago. She is a professional learning coach as well. Tara, would you like to say hello? Good afternoon, everybody. Woo! Full hands on deck. We're so excited to be here. And we know that it's a busy, busy, busy time of year for you. And we want to thank you for joining us as well, whether you're watching this live or the recorded webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Just letting you know, we always let you know the webinars are recorded whenever you register to attend a webinar, whether you're able to attend live or not, that registration tracks your email and sends you an automatic link to the recorded webinar. It takes 24 hours after this ends before it sends that to you. You can also access our archived webinars and the help articles, or you can go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash eduphoria videos, and there's a subscribe button. And I'll tell you this, whenever these webinars end, I convert those videos to YouTube, and it's faster than waiting for Zoom to send the email. If you're subscribed to our channel, when we publish those videos, you're notified when that is, is processed as well. So you might get it faster through the YouTube channel than through Zoom, but either way, you'll get an email letting you know, here's how to access the recorded video. We have a live Q&A window. So we are doing this live, it's unscripted. I mean, we do have a, an outline for what we're doing. But um, if you have any questions or comments about today's topic, use that Q&A window to post those questions there. We're able to view them and post responses as needed. If we get too over your head or if there's something you had a question about that maybe we didn't address, you can email us at training at eduphoria.net and one of us will access that and be able to respond to you. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover today. And actually, when I say we, I mean Paige. <laughs> Paige is so good about training on forethought that we're giving her almost all the time to cover it. We're going to cover the schedule itself as part of the planner, how to customize the template, how a teacher can individually customize the template for their own planner, using activities in their planner, and then also a little bit of working with a team, like the ability to share lessons and to get information collaboratively. I know that we have a future webinar coming up that will be more about using a team and shared planners. So we're giving a little bit of a taste on that in this one. I mean, that could be a whole hour itself of just shared and team planners. So we are gonna have time for that later to go more in depth about it. But this is what we're gonna cover today. And I'm gonna hand it over to Paige so that she can uh, take over from here. Here you go, Paige. All right. I am going to try to share, share my screen now. It, there we go. We're pros. <laughs> Got it on the second try, so. We've done this before, haven't we? <laughs> Absolutely. You would think. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start out by talking about setting your schedule, and that's the first thing that every teacher has to do um, when they first use Forethought, but it's also something that needs to happen at the beginning of each year, just to check on some things and make sure that you're set up and ready to go. So if you're a brand new teacher to 
forethought and this is the first time you've clicked on the forethought button then you're going to see this window right here that what that starts you through the process of setting up your planner and there'll be a button in the lower right hand corner that says next that you will we cut it off when we did the screenshot but you will see a lower right hand button that says next that will take you through that process if you haven't if, if you've already set up your planner and you're going back to it for the first time this year you won't see this screen but you can access it by going down to let me just show you in my planner down to the bottom left and you can go to change my settings and my schedules and when you go to my schedules it's going to take you back into that schedule wizard um, that would be the next screen if you were brand new so um, when you click on your that first screen and you click on the next button it brings you here where you're gonna add something into your schedule and that's exactly what uh, it's gonna bring you actually to this change my or my schedules page where you will add a schedule um, there's a button over here where you would add a schedule or you can edit the schedule that you have a couple of best practices you want to have one schedule and one schedule only so um, in order for you to be able to access all of your plans from year to year, think of it like a book with many chapters. You want one book or one schedule, but you want to be able to flip back to last year's chapter and find the lessons that you used last year and bring them forward if you want to, if it's something that you'd like to repeat. So you need to have them all in the same book in order to be able to do that. The best way to remember that <laughs> is to not put a year in the name of your schedule. I usually just put my name on there. Um, you can name it whatever you want to, but I recommend not putting a year because when next year when you come back in and you see that year, you're automatically going to think, oh, that was last year's planner. I need to make a new one for this year. And that's not the case. What you would want to do is go in and edit that schedule. So when I edit the schedule, I can correct that if I had a year on it from last year I could take it off right here and correct that title that I had given it and then I'm going to click my next button and go in and check are these still the preps that I'm teaching or do I have different preps this year from last year so if I were to remove a prep that I'm not teaching this year but I taught it last year I'm just going to remove that entry so currently this is what's going to display in my planner but that doesn't mean that I just deleted all of my last year's lesson plans from English one. I did not. Those plans are still in my planner on last year's date. But if I had removed it, all I have to do is add an entry and put it back. And then I will have everything that I had. I'll be able to bring those lessons forward. So the lessons are still there. It's just I don't need to look at them this year if I'm not teaching that this year so I'm gonna clean it out maybe this year I have a new prep that I didn't teach last year so I want to add a new entry to my schedule you have three choices the first one is a course with learning standards which is the typical thing that you're gonna add it basically means any course with TEKS or any other type of standards that you would be tracking so if it's an AP course and you're putting AP standards in there of course those are tied to TEKS also but whatever standards you're using you, that's the course type that you would use. If you have an A day, B day block schedule, that is the only time that you would use a mirrored course. Um, if you have, if, if I teach English one on A day and I also teach English one on B day, a mirrored course just keeps me from having to write that lesson plan on two different days. But the A day, B day schedule is the only time that I would need two schedules in my planner and it's the only time that I would need a mirrored course in my planner. So if you're not a day B day schedule, then that middle one doesn't really apply to you. And then the third type is a special entry and a special entry um, will allow you, I think I have a slide in here that shows all that. Yes. Um, a special entry will allow you to put in just anything else you need to plan for. You just need another block in your planner where you can write something. So it can be for tutoring. It can be for clubs that meet in your room after school and you want to remember to talk to them about certain things. It could be ARD notes for a student who's in one of your classes. Anything that you just need an extra block in your planner 
that can be a special entry course that you set up. It can also be used without notes. So it can be a with or without notes. Without notes, it would just be a placeholder and it would just say lunch or conference or recess. Those things, lunch, conference and recess, you don't have to put in your planner at all. But if you want to, you can do it with a special entry. The planner is only needed for you to write the lesson plans that you're going to teach. And if you teach um, one thing more than once a day, you only have to put it in there once. So you don't have to have something in your planner for every single class period. These are not about class periods, they're about preps. So I'm going to add a new course and the next thing that you do is drill down and find the course that you're talking about. So I'm going to go to middle school, language arts, and I'm going to add sixth grade language arts to my schedule. So if I have aware, if you're a school that has aware, it's going to ask you which of these class periods that I'm rostered to line up with sixth grade English. Well, they don't really because all I have in my rostered classes are English 2 and I am showing you a different prep. So I don't have anything that lined up. But if I went, if this was my English 2 class, I would go in and check all of these courses that apply to the English 2 that I'm setting up. The only exception might be these three pre-AP. I might have a different lesson plan for those and I might want to have those as a separate entry in my class, I mean in my schedule. So in fact, I'm going to go back and do that. Let's see, I'm going to go get my standards again for English 2. And this time, I'm going to name it English 2 Pre-AP. Another tip about your schedule is that you don't want to change this front part of the name of the course because that's how it, it that's how it lists the teaks. So that will let you know which standards are attached to this course. Um, but if you do need to add something at the end to distinguish it from another class, then you can do that. So I'm going to say pre-AP is this one. And then I would select these three courses which are my pre-AP. And when I went in and looked at my regular English 2 course, it would be tagged to these other. And I have a heck of a schedule there, don't I? Um, so I'm going to go in. If you don't have AWARE in our system, then you just won't see this part down at the bottom. If you do have AWARE and you go in and look at this before they have updated the rosters in your, it, for your school, you might see last year's schedule until they update the rosters and then you'll see this year's schedule. So if you go in and you don't see the right classes, just don't check anything and then you can go back and do that later on if you want to. This is not a huge deal if they're not set up correctly. Um, it helps a little bit with um, if you're going to add any of your aware stuff into your lesson planner, but it's not crucial. So if you don't have the right schedule, just don't worry about it. Don't check anything. I'm going to say next and that has added my new course in there and I could move it up or I could move it down. I could put it wherever I want to and it doesn't matter again for the schedule whether it's in the order that I teach it, but if I wanted it to be in the order that I teach it and I have pre-AP second period, then I could move it up. So based on my schedule, based on my rosters, I am not teaching English 1 this year, so I'm going to remove that entry and have just these two preps in my planner. That does not mean that my English 1 lessons from last year are gone. Those plans are still there. I can use them again if I start teaching English 1 again. So I'm going to say next. It's going to ask me if I need to add another schedule, and the answer is always going to be no unless I have a, an A day, B day block schedule. Other than that, I want one book with all my lessons in it. I'm going to click the next button. It tells me I'm done, but down in the lower right hand corner, I need to click on begin using forethought. So that's my exit button. Um, all of our next and finish and all of those buttons are in the lower right hand corner. So that's where I want to click. And that's going to take me to my planner and it's going to take me to today's date. Now I'm looking at today's date and it's showing me sixth grade English and English one. Hmm. I just set up my schedule to be something entirely different. 
the reason it's showing this is because I had clicked on that day. You can see that all these days are bold in my calendar over here. I don't know how well you can see that. I'll zoom in a little bit. Any of those days that are bold, I had already clicked on or already visited. And when you click on a date in Forethought in your planner, it stamps the template on the date. So it stamped my schedule as I had it at that time, which was last year's schedule. I was teaching grade six in English one. It stamped the schedule and it stamped my district's template on there. In order to make the changes show up, I need to go up to the top here and say delete today's plans. And I know that's a scary sounding button for teachers always, but if you look, there's really not a lesson plan here. There's only a template. So I'm not losing any of my work. I'm just gonna say delete today's plans. It's going to erase the old stamp and stamp it again with my new schedule. Now I have my correct preps and I have the district template in there as well. So those are the things that you need to do to build your schedule. Go in each year, make sure that you have the right courses there, remove any courses that you aren't teaching anymore so that your day's planner will look like you want it to look. Okay, let me see if there's anything I left out that I wanted to talk about. Um, I did talk about the fact that only if you're aware will you see the rosters and if they're not correct, just don't check anything at the time because it, it, that does have to wait on your district to, to do those rosters. Um, last little tips, I think I talked about all of these. Only one schedule unless you're on an A day, B day block. Don't add a year to the name of your schedule because that will tempt you to make a new one each year. Um, only add your preps. It doesn't have to be by class period. So it's one entry per plan. And if I teach that same plan three times during the day, it just has to be in my planner once and then keep the course and or entry name as it is unless you need to add a clarifier at the end. Okay, let's talk about customizing the template. Or, let me check in. Joel, are there any questions that I need to deal with about the schedule? Uh, no questions so far. Awesome. Okay, we're going to talk about customizing the template. So as you saw when I set my schedule, a template came in from my district with the prompts that they want me to include. So they want me to include which day am I in on in this unit, um, the key understandings, the activities, those are the things that are in here. I can customize it and add some additional things in there. I can't delete, I shouldn't delete out anything that my district is expecting me to have, but I can add other things in there and make it my own that way. So I'm gonna come back over to my English 2 class and I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna have my objective and my warm up. Um, before materials though, I usually want to put my vocabulary in there. So I'm gonna add that. And just so that my administrator and everybody who looks at my plans doesn't think, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm gonna make that a different color so that they can tell that's something that I added. Maybe I wanna color code it for some other reason, but I can change the color of certain things just by highlighting them and going up to my color wheel here at the top and changing that color. Um, maybe when I get down to my assess under assessment, I'm going to have a place in here for my writing because we're gonna write every day. Sometimes that writing will be the assessment. Sometimes it will be some other part of the lesson, but I'm gonna put it in there so that I can keep track. I'm gonna highlight it after I typed it and come up to my color wheel and I'm gonna pick my red again. Um, so I have added two things to the lesson plan that I want in there that my district didn't have as part of the process. So I don't wanna have to do that every day um, to go in and type those things and change the colors and all of that. So up at the top of my lesson planner, there is a wrench in the box for English 2 and I'm, I'm in the template for English 2. And so I'm gonna go up to this wrench and I'm gonna choose set as default text for entry. So I'm gonna click on this button that says set as default text for entry and it tells me the default text has been set. So now when I go to any day in my planner that has not already been stamped, it will put this enhanced template on there. Now it only does it for the one course where I selected from the settings. 
So if I want that same thing for my English 2 course, I can do two things. I can either click in here and, and add vocabulary and change the color and all of that, or I can just highlight the template the way I like it, copy it, come down to English 2 and highlight that one and paste over it, and then save as default text for entry for English 2. And now both of my courses have the template that I want with my changes in there. If I go to a clean date, so I'm going to go to the 25th, I can tell that I have never visited the 25th, it's not bold. So it has not been stamped with my old template. If I go to the 25th and click, uh, yes, no, let me cancel, make it do a force an auto save. Okay. Now I want to go to the 25th and it's not going. So I'm going to go to the 26th and just see what it does. There we go. So I went to the 26th, which was another date that was not stamped, and it got my template with my changes. So it's going to hold going forward to any date that has not been stamped. But if I go to tomorrow, which is already bold, it will have the old stamp on it or the old template. To get that updated, I go to delete today's plans. It will fix both my schedule and my template to be correct. So I would want to go in for each of these days that was already bold and delete my plans and get everything corrected. The moral of this story is don't click until you know everything's the way you want it to be. So um, I like to start building my schedule and my template on a day before school even starts. So I would come back to August 3rd and build my schedule and get my template right and play around with it as much as I want to and then check when I go to the 4th, is that correct? That way I know it's right when I click on an actual school day and I don't have to go through and do all this cleanup where I go to every single day that I accidentally clicked on and have to delete the day's plans. But by doing that, you can customize the template to include the things that you want to include while still doing all the things that your district wants you to do. So I have everything my district wanted, but I have those other things that make it good for me. I could reorganize this if I wanted to or, or do anything that I wanted to. Once I go in and set default text as entry, that's going to make that my template from that point forward. Um, I do want to show you something that is not really something that you can do as a teacher, but it's something your district can do, and that is these checklists. So um, in my district, we have checklists set up where I can say, in today's lesson, I'm going to start out with some whole group instruction, but then I'm going to put them in smaller groups. Um, I'm going to have my students do a ticket out the door, which is pretty common, but we do a daily reflection journal, so that's also going to be an assessment strategy that I'll use. I might have a quiz today, too, so I could check off as many as I, I need to. My instructional strategies are going to include a graphic organizer and some questioning strategies, which I'm looking over right now and not seeing. Well, maybe I took that one out of my list. Um, and then I'm also going to be using a document camera and I'm going to be showing a little video. So I'm going to include all the things that we're doing in my class that day and click the close button. And it puts those up here in my course box. So I just added a lot of information to my lesson plan without having to do a lot of typing. It's those standard things that we can have in a list. If you think that would be helpful to your team, you can talk to your district people and they can set it up at the district level for you um, so that you can use those checklists. The other nice thing about the checklists is that anything that's in this gray box is trackable, so you can have data about how often you're using those kinds of things, which is helpful. Okay, um, let's go back and see if I missed anything. We talked about setting as default text. We talked about why doesn't it show your changes. That's because it's bold and you have to go in and delete today's plans. So now we're going to talk about using activities. Um, I'm going to go to my lesson planner and I'm going to uh, find a lesson plan. Maybe, let me go grab one. I should have, let's see. Let me go get an activity. Oh, 
I only have six in there. I'm not good. Okay, so I'm going to pretend that I have a really good lesson plan here. That I worked on it today, and what we have here is a really good lesson plan. Um, the kids loved it. And I know I want to teach it again. So what I can do is either remember the date and go back to that date and move it forward using a couple of different copy features. I am not a date savant, and I don't think in terms of dates. I think in terms of themes or units. So I, I want another way to keep up with it. So I'm going to click on this button right here that looks like a gear. I know it's a tiny little thing. Looks like a gear with a plus sign on it. And when I float my mouse over it, it says, add this lesson to my activities. So I'm going to click on that gear, and I'm going to get this pop-up window. The pop-up window says the lesson has been added to your activities. If you don't see this pop-up window, it's not going to work, and that's because pop-up blockers are turned on on your computer. They could be turned on in the browser, or they could be turned on in the operating system, but somebody in your technology department should be able to help you turn those off, or at least allow the forethought, thought, the forethought URL to access or get through the pop-up blocker so that you can do this because without this pop-up it doesn't work. I'm going to say OK and then when I go to my activities this other tab over here on the left I will see yes I do want to leave I will see a lesson that says activity for English 2 and when I click on it it's going to show me that stuff that I typed a minute ago really good lesson plan. So this is the lesson plan that I want to say. We're pretending like it's a real lesson. And this is how the system always names it. Activity 4 and the course that I had selected when I put it in there. So one of the first things I want to do is change the name there because that's not going to help me if I have 15 that are named the same way. I like to put E for English, 2 for the level. Um, I might put G for grammar. And it might be, um, it might be, here, I'll, I'll put gerunds, which my kids always called geruns. That always made me laugh. Um, so I'm going to put that in my title now and save it. If I had not added my standards, which I didn't here, I could come over on the right-hand side and I could double-click on those standards and add them in there. And I would want to find the one that is the most important standard and right click on it and maybe it's the one at the bottom because I brought them in, in in numerical order but if this is the most important I would want to right click on it and set it as the primary learning standard that moves it up to the top and that's going to be the standard that it's tied to when I go look for it later on so again I can save it I can still edit it if I wanted to, and I have to refresh in order to make the name change over here on the left, so I'm going to do that real quickly. Um, I changed it at the top and I saved it. Now you can see that it's changed over here on the left, and so all of my, my changes are there. I can add attachments if I want to. I can add images. I can add you know all different things to this lesson, hyperlinks, whatever I need. And then if I want to share this lesson with other teachers in my district, I can click this publish button. The publish button will send it to whoever is responsible for curriculum in your district and they get the opportunity to approve it. And if they approve it, then it's available for every teacher who teaches English 2 when they click on um, English 2 Teak 1D. When they click on that, they will see that resource. So if I publish it, um, it's going to change the icon. Um, you can see this one. Let me zoom in a little bit. The one that I have going right now, I have edited it. I changed the name and I added some standards so it's showing I'm in the editing process. When I publish it, it's going to get these two little uh, a red and green arrow going in a circle. And then when it gets um, approved, then it will just be a regular gear with nothing on it. So I'm going to click Publish. And it will change the icon over there on the left. I may have to refresh before that shows up. Um, but then it's out there in the queue to be approved. Even before it's approved, I can still use it. So I'm going to go back to my planner and say, 
um, on a different day. Let me go to, okay, here we are on, on today's date. I'm going to click on English 2, and I'm going to go find 1D. There it is. That was the primary standard in my activity. So when I click on it, I can see the lesson pops up down here in my resources box. I can double click. And there's going to be a little button here that says use in plans. So I will click use in plans. And it brings all the teaks in. Um, now my template was already there because I had to click on the date first, but I can delete that template out and leave just the lesson as written, which presumably would be in the same format as the template. Um, but I could just delete the blank template from above it, and then I have that lesson in my in my plans again that I've used in the past. So I don't have to remember the date, and I don't even really have to remember the the teak that it's tied to. I just have to go to my activities. Let me say, I have to go to my activities, find the lesson over there, and then I will look at the primary standard and say, yes, this is the one I want to use. So I'm going to go find 1D and then pull it in my lesson planner that way. So for those of you who are like me who don't um, think in terms of dates, finding it this way is helpful. And Paige, I was going to add to for activities as a former instructional technology person who was constantly finding resources for my teachers in different applications, like just, you know, you use like Google Earth and they have like some pre-made lesson uh, things that you can use in a classroom and they have all the resources there. Instead of like putting all of that in a network drive or a shared drive somewhere and then saying to the teachers, hey, if you're looking for an activity, you can go look over here in this other thing. I would create them as activities tied to the learning standards. Exactly. And that way, my teachers had those. I mean, I worked in a district where the entire science department changed in a year. We had a brand new batch Holy of teachers people. come in, and we wanted to make sure they had proper resources to support them. So it was converting a lot of stuff on my end, but making it available for them where they could search by the learning standard and find activities across their um, all of their standards. So just that's putting a it very, all in one place. That's a very good point. And I'm not showing the management side today, but these activities can be built at the management on the management side at the district level and made available to teachers or they can be created by teachers. I just showed you how to do it from the lesson planner that I would go up and, and create an activity from an existing plan. But if I am one of those teachers who goes to conferences and can't wait to teach something when I get back to my classroom, but it's summer and I'm not teaching yet and I'm not writing my lesson plans yet, I can still go over to my activities and create a new activity. I'm going to tell it which course it's for and say so create because I have to tell it that since I'm not in my planner right now and it's going to give me a blank thing that looks like a lesson plan but instead of having a date I'm going to just give it a name so I'm going to say new conference trick so this is something that I learned and I would write it up like a lesson plan but I'm not assigning it to any particular day. I don't have a, a calendar here. I'm not assigning it to a date. I would, however, go in and add my standards and everything so that when I save it, and I could even publish it, it will be in my list of activities. So I think I hit save, but it's not refreshing. So I'm going to do a refresh and hope that it really did save. Um, so it should, there it is right there. It should show up in my list and I can use it on whatever date I find in the new year that I want to use it. So I can create them from the activities page or I can create them from a lesson that I've already taught and put them out there. I can share this one, publish it for my school just like I did the other one if I want to, which is a great way to build that repertoire of lessons to have that big um, pile of options for teachers, especially new teachers coming in. And then hopefully my administrators, my district level people are also going to be adding some activities in for me. But that to me is a great way to save them. If I named it with the course name and 
the unit and a title, then that's going to kind of sort them together. I've, I can't make folders over here, which I would like to be able to do, but I can at least lump all the E2 things together and all the E6 things together so I know at least where my grade levels are, and I can search for them that way. And I was going to add one more thing, Paige. Okay. Uh, I've heard of a district that uh, when they do send teachers to conferences, the payback is they require them to submit a certain amount of activities. Ooh, I love that. Like That's to a, show yeah. what they learned and also provide tools for other teachers to use. And then there's the button on the right, the change associated course even. So like where there are teachers who, um, if you click show again. Yeah, that'll show me the whole, the whole list of my the, courses. The change associated course. Um, being able to pick another course. I've had teachers who change grade levels or change schools completely, like from middle school to high school. And they had all these activities in their folder that they didn't want to get rid of. So they've created them in here and shared them with the teachers at the other campuses. And that's, that's a wonderful way to collaborate. And especially now with everything going on and y'all are needing to share lessons more than ever, this is a great way to do it. Not just with your, your, team in, on your campus, but anybody in your district that teaches what you teach. Um, so I, th I think that's a, a fabulous idea. They can be created from the lesson planner or from the activities tab, and we did talk about publishing them to the district level. Um, and then we also looked at how you use them in your planner. Okay, so just as a quick review, when you go to view that activity, you're going to see it over here. You're going to want to change the name so that it's something you'll recognize. Make sure that the top standard in your list is your primary one because that's where, what it's going to be tagged to in the, in the curriculum pane. And then publish if you want to share it with others. Okay, so working with a team. You can create a team planner and put your teammates in there and y'all can collaborate on the lesson planning process. So activities was really a way to share your lesson plans and publish them out there so that people can use them as they want to. But another way to tackle the process is to create a team and work collaboratively as a team to create the lesson. So it's not, I'm just going to show you mine and you can use it if you want to. It's we're going to put together the whole week and we're all going to do the same thing all week. And maybe you split it up where I'll write this week's lesson plans if you'll write next week or I'll write Monday, Wednesday, Friday if you'll write Tuesday, Thursday. However you want to break it up on your team is fine, but you're going to collaboratively work to get that done. Um, you, the main difference when you're using a team planner is that you do have to check it out before you can edit because unlike Google Docs, you can't have multiple people writing in the same lesson plan at the same time. So when I go to English 1 and I check it out, nobody else can be writing on English 1 on this particular date. I could re be on English 1 on a different date or I could be on a different prep on the same date, but I can't be in the same course on the same date. That's can't be in the same lesson at the same time. So I'd want to click to check it out. And then for anybody else who tries to check it out while I have it, they'll get this message that says this plan cannot be checked out because, and it'll tell you who's got it. So it'll tell you the name of the person who's cur currently working in that lesson. And then you can go back and check later on. So, um, that's how you know if somebody else has it and how you know if you can, you can be working in it at that time. It does do an auto save and that will check it back in. Okay, we're going to come back to that in a minute because I do want to show how to create a team planner. So I'm going to go back to my planner and I'm, you'll notice that I have some teams already created. I'm already a part of some teams, but if I needed to create a new one, I would go down to the bottom left of my screen and click on create a new team. One of the important things that was on that first slide, and I don't know that I mentioned it, is that only one person needs to do this create a new team part. When I create the team, I'm going to put everybody in it. But my recommendation is that you tell people that you're doing it, because when a team just shows up over here on the left out of nowhere, it freaks some people out. So let them know I'm, you're going to see a new team show up, and this is what it's going to be, and this is why I'm doing it. So if I wanted to do um, grade 
six ELAR as my team. I could write a description if I wanted to, and then I'll click the next button in the lower right hand corner. It automatically puts me on the team because I'm the creator, but I can go in and add any members that I want. So I could go and find all the teachers that have that in their name, and I'm going to add Baxter, and it only lets me do one at a time. So I'll do Baxter now, and I can go in and add another member. So I would just keep adding people in until I have everybody that I want in my planner. So when I say, okay, this is my whole team. I've got three people and I'm going to share it with them. Once I have all my teammates there, I'll click the next button in the lower right hand corner and I have to add the course. So I would go in and say, this is going to be, since I said it was sixth grade, middle school, there's English language arts and reading, grade six. I'll click my next button. That puts the course in there. I can have a team for just one course, so it's all just the sixth grade language arts teachers, and since that's what I named my team, that's what I'm going to do. But I could make a team called middle school English and put sixth, seventh, and eighth grade in there, put all the English teachers for the whole middle school in the team, and then they could contribute to the grade level that applies to them. I can contribute to one course on a team or all the courses on the team, depending on what I teach. So I'm going to click the next button because I don't need to add any more courses to this particular team. And it says I'm done, so I'm going to save in the lower right hand corner and return to my planner. So now I have a new team planner down here. And you'll notice right now I'm on my planner. If I click down here to grade six, I'm on the, the team planner. I don't see my English two anymore. I'm in the team. Um, I also cannot, let me close that, I didn't mean to click on the checkbox, I cannot type anything, I can't get a flashing cursor. You can't see me, but I'm typing on my keyboard right now and it's not showing up on the screen because I'm locked out because I have to check it out to edit. So there's that little pencil that we saw on the slide, I'm going to check it out, say okay, I am ready to work, and now I can type what I want for my objective make whatever changes I want to. I can add in my standards. I can do anything that I want to do with the lesson. When I'm done, I can click the Save button, and you'll notice the, the pencil comes back. I'm checked out again, so I would have, if I want to work, I mean, I'm checked back in, so I can't work. Um, so if I wanted to do some more, I would need to click on that pencil again, check it out, so that I can continue working. Anytime I save or it auto saves, it's going to check the lesson back in. It thinks that I'm done. So then I would have to check it out again. Okay, so as a team, we can work collaboratively to put together our lessons. All the people on the team can do that. Um, when we're done, and I'm going to switch over to another team and pretend like. Um, Let's see, in this team, I'm going to go to September 7th. So the week of September 7th um, is a Labor Day holiday, and then if I go to the next day, I'll see my plans. The team has worked and gotten the plans together. After you've done all of the planning, which needs to be done either, you have three views. It needs to be done either in the plan by day, which is the default, and that's what we're looking at now where we see one day at a time and I would see all of my preps for that day if I was in my personal planner. I can also plan by course, which is going to show me my preps, and it's I'll have a drop down. Um, it's going to show me a whole week of English 2 lessons. So I have Monday's English 2 lesson, Tuesday's English 2 lesson, Wednesday's, Thursday's, and Friday's. So all the lessons are in there for the whole week when I view by course. The third view is the view weeks plans. And I said earlier that you do your planning in one of these two. Um, I always use the Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. You got plan by course, plan by day, view weeks plans. So the view weeks plans is not a fully functional planner. You won't go there to write your plans, but you'll go there to look at them. So I'm going to click on view weeks plans. You'll notice that there's 
there are very few tools up here in my toolbar. There's not much I can do in terms of editing. There is no curriculum pane, so I can't add any teaks in there. I can't even see the teaks that are added to these lessons, although I know that they're in there. I can't see them. So this is not the place to plan. This is the place to look and say, oops, I forgot to do Thursday, but not the place to actually write the plans. So I'm going to get a snapshot view of what is going on during the week. But the most important thing about this view is these two buttons up here, um, especially this one, because once I have worked with my team and we have decided that the whole week of September 7th is ready to go, I'm going to click copy week. And it's going to copy all five days into my personal planner with one click. So now when I go to my lesson planner and I go to that same week, you'll see those plans are there. Now I do have the template there because I had already visited that day and I got a stamp. So I have to go in and delete those stamps out. If I had not clicked on that week at all in my planner, I wouldn't have to do this step. So the goal is don't click in your personal planner until after you have copied the lessons in from your team planner. If I had two different teams that I belong to, like here I have an English 2 team and I have an English 1 team, I could go to my English 1 team and copy the weekend and it would put them down here. It will bring in whatever matches between your planner and that team planner. So I could go to two different teams to get my lessons in for the week since I have two preps. That to me is the best part of the team planner that I can with one click go to the view weeks plans, click on the copy week and bring those the whole week at one time into my planner. And then I can go in and view them by day if I want to. So I'm on Monday, which is the holiday and I can go day by day and see that those plans are in there so I can use it the way I like to use the planner, I just have to work with my team and go to the week's view in order to bring them in. It is important to bring those plans in. A um, couple things. One, managing the team planner uh, is important. It's a good idea to designate a team member as the manager because of this note up here at the top. If you remove all the members of any team, it removes the planner altogether. When the planner is removed, all the lessons are deleted and there is not an undo. So you always want to leave somebody in the team planner so that that planner stays alive. And the best way to do that is to have a designated manager. So if somebody leaves, that manager is the one to remove them. You don't have like random people going in and, and changing things because I might decide I'm going to remove everybody except Susie and somebody else decides they're going to remove Susie and leave somebody else and we delete everybody accidentally. So it's better to have one manager to avoid those problems. The other thing that will avoid those problems is copying those plans to your planner. Um, it's important to do that for a couple of reasons. One, if you do the standard coverage report that shows how many times you've used the standards, that pulls from your personal planner. And if you don't put those t those lessons in your personal planner, you don't get credit for having covered those, those teaks. Um, also, you can differentiate your lessons for your specific students. So once your team plans and says, this is what we're doing for the week, I copy them into my planner and then I say, okay, everybody else has a different level of kids than me. I know this part of the activity is not going to work for my kids. So I'm going to change that one section and everything else will stay the same. I can do that in my personal planner because it's mine. And then finally, if the team planner is accidentally deleted, you still have those plans in your personal planner. You don't lose them from there. So that's a good reason, three good reasons to make sure that you copy, do that copy step and get the, the plans in your planner. Hey Paige, I have one more to add to the list. Actually, okay. Rick, Rick brought it up as a question because he has experience as a principal. Uh, teachers that are on a team planner when he would pull the report to see who had done their lesson plans for the week, it would show that they had not done their lesson plans for the week. Exactly. If I go in as an administrator and I look at lesson plans over here, um, you know, I go to a campus and I'm going to look, well, we don't have very many, but if I, if I don't see your name or if I don't see any plans there, I don't know why. 
I can't, there's a way that I can look at the team planner, but I don't know that that's what I'm not seeing. So the, the thing that they're going to look for is your plans because that's your record of what you are teaching. And so you want to make sure that you're getting credit for it when they go and look at your planner. That's, that is a good, um, a good example of administrators do look at those plans. And they pull reports. And like I said, either for you or for the administrator, if I went to run this standards report up here for myself, um, it would not show any of the standards that I didn't bring in from any of those team plans. And the, when the principal runs it, same thing. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do we have any other unanswered questions? Um, it's not really, uh, well, it's not a question about anything you've covered. Uh, Rick was asking a question. If you have multiple classes that are the same, but they're moving at different pace, like for example, English two, first, second, third period, but third period has differences in their daily plans. Would you recommend a separate schedule? I think, I think that I think that would depend. If it was, if that third period class that was different, if that was a co-talk class and they were regularly going to be different, I would set them up as a separate prep and I would put co-taught at the end of it. Same standards, but but um, if it was this class got behind for a short period of time because we had a fire drill and they were they missed a day. I would just make notes in my planner that third period is here where everybody else is somewhere else and assuming that they would eventually get to the same place. So it depends on if it's a, a temporary or a permanent thing. If it's based on the group of students and it's going to be perpetual, I would probably create a separate class, a separate entry for that. And I would still put the same grade level teaks in there, but I would put something at the end of the name that let me know what was going on, why it was different. Yeah. Good question though, because that's what I would do for my co-talk classes or for my GT classes. I would put the same standards in there, but put the designation at the end to let me know that's why this is a different, that's why the plans don't match. Same teaks, different plans, here's the reason. Yeah, and I've, I've seen where a, a planner has a special entry. They have the same course, but the entry is called MOD, like modification. Yes. And it's the same information from the lesson planner, but they're going in and adding those specific notes for that entry. Good example. All right, Tara is going to take us through our last few slides. Tara, do you want me to turn it over for you to drive or do you want me to drive for you? I'll let you drive, Paige. Okay. All right. So she's going to tell us about all the help that's available. Yeah, so guys, we want to make sure that you feel plenty of support as you leave here today. When you're in any of our applications, Eddie Helps is there at your fingertips. You don't even have to leave the application to get some helpful um, insight into whatever you're experiencing or whatever questions you might have. Um, you can also click help and go to our Zendesk where we have some curated articles on lots of different topics that will help you answer questions um, that you or your teachers or you know colleagues might have as you're exploring these tools. I know Paige shared a lot of information with us today and there's, there's no way all of it is just going to be at the forefront of your mind when you go play around. Um, so this is going to be a great resource for you as you get into your planner and start experiencing that firsthand. And everything we did today is in these articles. So thank you for showing them that. Mm -hmm. um, we had some insightful questions as we went through this afternoon, but as more questions come to your mind as you play and interact with this tool, feel free to reach out to training at edgeforia.net and someone will be in touch with you. Um, to make sure that we assist you and support you with whatever your needs might be. Um, and if you have any questions that are rattling in your brain right now, feel free to throw them up there and one of us can get them answered before we leave here today. And then upcoming, we have some more informational webinars for you next week. We'll be diving into AWARE to go over student portfolios. Then upcoming, we'll be back in stride for some virtual t-tests, show you um, how to use those systems for your teachers for evaluation purposes. And then on September 16th, we'll be coming back to Forethought and looking more at those team planners and how that system can work at your campus. 
As always, we're so glad you all joined us today. Paige, Joel, any parting words? No, just thank you for your time and do let us know if there's anything we can do to help. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. And have a great rest of the week. Yes. Bye-bye.